Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at sacred scripture, the Word of God, through the lens of sacred tradition. That is the tradition that goes back to the apostles and through them back to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we want to have you become part of the show. You can do so like these nice folks have done from various parts of the country by being here in our live studio audience. Or you can call during the live program, and that is Tuesday from 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number you can call in North America is one 800 2 2-1-9-4-6-0. If you are not in North America, that number won't work, but you still can call in by calling country code 1, area code 205 271 you can also send us your questions and comments via email by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com or follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now today, we'll start to take a look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, where our Lord Jesus rebukes the sea and calms the storm. Then we'll also take a look at some of the Old Testament background, especially in the book of Job and the Psalms, because that is extremely important. It's essential, in fact, to understand our Lord's relationship with the sea. We'll talk about how our dis Lord's disciples, whom he calls men of little faith, don't see the whole picture, and they have trouble connecting the dots of what's going on around them. So a lot of us can be in that position too. Now we are continuing through my book called Praying the Gospels, Jesus Miracles in Galilee. Now that's still available, of course, at EWTNRC.com ewtnrc.com. It is item number 52885. 52885. And we are on chapter uh, 7. And this is Meditation 3, where Jesus rebukes the sea in Matthew 8, verse 26. So, it says, Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now, this is after he uh, had been wakened. Remember, he was asleep in, on a pillow in the back of the boat, and they, they woke him up. And Jesus, after he's awakened, gives them reason, gives them proof for placing faith in him. He speaks and calms the sea. This is a great, great deal. Calms the wind by his word. And this is part of the theology of understanding Christ as God the word made flesh. That he, as God, has this power over the wind and the sea. Now, in the Old Testament, we see that the Lord God relates to the sea. And what it says there will be helpful to us. Uh, you know, the book of Job is one that people start reading but don't get to the whole end. And it, it's a very, very rich book about the problem of pain. Why do good people, righteous people, who didn't do anything wrong, why do they suffer? And after 
a series of debates. There are three series of debates with Job's friend, between each friend and Job. And then this other young man shows up, and he gives his opinions, mostly opinions that come from the standard school of wisdom, that <clears throat> you really must have done something wrong. God doesn't let good people suffer. That's, that's what the friends of Job uh, say. And finally, the Lord speaks to Job. And eventually, he'll even say, the friends would have been better being quiet. They didn't speak the truth. They don't know what they're talking about. But he says to, he asks Job a series of questions in Job, uh, beginning in chapter 38. And in verses 8 to 11, it says, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth, burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. When Job is asking, when the Lord is asking Job that question, remember it's the Lord posing this question to Job, he is asking this rhetorically, who shut in the sea and who made it come forth with the winds and clouds? And this is no small issue. In fact, this is one of the amazing components of planet Earth. How did so much water get formed on the Earth? And I've seen geologists debating, the, uh, I've, I've read some of the debates, that it could have been lots and lots of comets crashing into the Earth. That's one of the theories that, that, that they pose, because it's Hard to figure out how all of this water is here and not on the other planets. You know, so this is something mysterious. And by the Lord asking that rhetorically, the answer that is implied in the Lord God's rhetorical questions is that it was the Lord God who made that possible. The Lord God who brought forth the sea and stayed its proud waves and said that this is as far as you can go. And Job, as a mere human being, this is part of the point of the rhetorical questions, Job can't do that. No mortal can. This is always one of the issues, too, that I have when we hear a lot of politicians putting human beings in char charge of global climate change. You know, the Earth's climate has changed lots of times. Most of the times, long before humans existed. Billions of years and millions of years before humans existed. And this is something that has a lot of factors in it, including the tilt of the Earth as it makes its orbit, if it varies slightly on its spin, that changes climate. I mean, we had a good 100,000 years of an ice age up until just 12,000 years ago. That's, that's not long, 12,000 years for, for you, but not for nuns. At any rate, this is, you know, uh, human beings have very limited <laughs> control over the, the earth, uh, volcanic eruptions, all sorts of things up through that. And so, you know, for, to, to say that we have control is not easy. And then you go over to the Psalms where it describes the Lord God as having power over the sea. For instance, in Psalm 65, 
begin with verse 5 through 7. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains. You are girt, girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples. So here, the Lord God is in complete control of the sea. And then we also see in Psalm 89, verse 9, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And in Psalm 93, verses 3 to 4, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, majestic on high is the Lord. Now, think about that and what Christ has just done. And then you add in there Psalm 104, verse 6 through 7. You cover the earth with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. As most of you should know, there are mountain ranges underneath the ocean. Now, we don't usually see them, but submariners sometimes do, especially you know, in the uh, bottom of some seas. And there are canyons in the, in the Pacific that are far deeper than the Grand Canyon. So the waters stood above the mountains, and at your rebuke they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take to flight. God commands the waters. And then in Psalm 107, verse 28 to 29, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. These are all texts that show that the one who has control of the sea is the Lord God. And here, Jesus Christ speaks his word and calms the waves and the wind, just as the Lord God does in these passages in the Old Testament. And this is something that then makes more sense, gives more power to the way that we heard earlier, that when he speaks his word of forgiveness to the paralytic that was let down through the roof, you can see that it's possible that he could have that power because he also speaks a word and tells the man to get up. And this is a very key thing. Now, in this, we need to see a, a balance here. And this passage helps us to learn to keep balance. Because throughout Christianity, various people, theologians, and sometimes bishops and priests alike, have been tempted to emphasize one of Jesus' natures over the other. For instance, a priest named Arius denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. And today his uh, followers would be Jehovah's Witnesses and a few others. There are others who were monophysites. They denied the humanity of Jesus. I was just talking to some Methodist minister friends of mine, and one of the people that's you know, trying to move up in their hierarchy uh, basically denies that Jesus is really God made flesh. You know, he just sees um, that the, the flesh is, uh, you know, just an illusion. He looks human, but he isn't really. Now, that's, that's an ancient heresy, by the way. It's not new. It was called docetism. It, docetism means Jesus seemed to be human, but really wasn't. And so, uh, but he's just God. 
And it's wrong to focus just on the humanity of Jesus and deny the divinity. And it's also wrong to, to focus on the divinity and de deny the humanity. He has two natures fully. And this is something that we need to pay attention to because some people so focus on the humanity of Jesus that they dismiss his miracles. They dismiss his divine dignity. They don't want to worship him. They don't think that he wants our worship. Some think that we're, he's not worthy of our worship. And sometimes this shows up in certain liturgical movements where instead of the normal gestures of adoration of Christ, genuflecting and bowing and expressing words. Uh, for instance, I've been in places, uh, one place where I was invited not to come back and say Mass because I had led the congregation in praying the Gloria at Mass on a feast day, a major feast. And they, they, they didn't do that anymore. And so they didn't really want to adore Christ. And this is something that we have to be careful of. Some people so much want Jesus to be a friend, which he is, and he says he is. In John 15, I no longer call you my servants, but my friends. But then they use that to dismiss adoration of Christ. They so want to focus on the community experience of Mass that they remove the Blessed Sacrament. Now, not so much anymore. That's changed a lot. You know, they're, they're really changing that at the churches in the last couple decades. But that was a trend. And there, some liturgists were saying that adoring Jesus in the tabernacle was a distraction from Mass. Well, if Jesus is a distraction at Mass, who exactly is the main attraction there? The priest? The choir? The lectors? The altars? No, it's Jesus Christ that has to be the center and the focus both of adoration as well as our love and devotion and friendship. And a lot of people experience this tension. And it's very important for us to pray to it, so about it. So I would recommend that you, in meditating on this passage, where he shows clearly divine power over the sea and the wind, use those Old Testament passages, then speak to him as a friend to a friend, but speak to him about the tensions you might feel between his divinity and his humanity. What would he say to you about that? What does the scripture say to you about that? And learn to have a deeper understanding of how Jesus Christ truly is God and he truly is man and that both were his plan to redeem humanity in order to restore us to the image and likeness of God. And I recommend that you conclude with the Anima Christi, the soul of Christ prayer, and the glory be to the Father. Give him the adoration that is his due. All right, we're gonna take a little break and we'll come back in a couple of minutes and see the conclusion of this calming of the storm at sea. So please stay with us.
All right, welcome back. We are now dealing with the fourth meditation that I wrote about in on the calming of the storm at sea. In, in this, we're taking a look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 27 where the, disci the disciples themselves in the boat are amazed at what Jesus has done. So it says, they were amazed. What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, I mentioned in the first segment today that the Lord God was asking rhetorical questions. Here, it's not quite a rhetorical question. They're genuinely perplexed. Remember, the apostles were all Jewish. They were steeped in the Old Testament every Sabbath. They would hear Scripture read. They, uh, the Pharisees had a lectionary. Uh, there were a couple of different lectionaries. Uh, one was a one-year cycle. They also had a three-year cycle. And the core of their lectionary was to read from the Torah, that is, the first five books of the Bible. But they would also have other readings called Haftarot. The Haftarot would be read from the prophets, some of the other writings, uh, the various histories and psalms and stuff. So they would know this. They would know these passages. They've heard it. And being aware, especially of the psalms, many Jewish people memorize the psalms and pray them. Uh, they, they know them by heart because uh, not everybody could afford to have a copy of the Bible. Copies of the Bible are expensive extremely expensive. To have a whole copy of the Bible uh, at the time of Christ would have cost, in our money, anywhere from one hundred and fifty to $250,000. And this is really expensive because they wrote it on calfskin. So you had to get the leather and treat it and then have somebody write on it. It was extremely expensive. So this is, uh, but they did memorize it. They would hear it and they would memorize it. And they, they have this question, what's, what sort of man is this? They connect the question with his power to cause the winds to calm down and the waves to obey him. It's not normally what human beings can do. Most of us observe the weather, but we don't control it. Maybe in your house, the, you, you can get heat. This winter may be difficult. And air conditioning. But this is something that um, is pretty limited as much you can do weather control inside your house. And these men of little faith, remember, that's how Jesus addressed them. When they woke him up from sleeping during the storm, he called them men of little faith. Because of their little faith, they're still having trouble putting the pieces together. You know, they, they've got dots of data. They, they see this in Scripture about God calming the storms. Then they see Jesus command the storm to be still and the waves then obey him and they stop. You know, they, they see these different dots. But all they see at this point are the individual dots. They haven't connected the dots into a whole picture. And this eludes them. They don't know how to connect the dots. And one of the things each of us can consider is that we are a lot like them. That's one of the part of the genius of the New Testament writers and the Old Testament writers, too. They were perplexed. They didn't understand. They didn't go and say, oh, yeah, yeah we got it right away. Oh, we, we knew what was going on. No, they don't do that. They lay out exactly how they experienced 
these confusing situations that were beyond their ability to understand. And in so doing, they help us to relate to their process of moving from being people of little faith to becoming men of great faith. But it took them time and lots of mistakes. And we ourselves are in that same kind of process. We are gradually learning the process of learning who Jesus Christ is. We're gathering in the dots of information. And oftentimes, like the apostles who got into the boat to just go across the lake, they're just going to be sailing seven miles across, that's all. And that got them into this big adventure of a storm, a sudden storm, that they didn't realize was going to happen and how they're scared, they have little faith, and then the, Jesus calms the storm. Think about the different adventures in your own life, the adventures that you have, and especially the living out of adventures with trying to stay close to Jesus Christ. Those adventures are where we are going to find out more and more about his identity. And because we engage in the adventures of life, the risks of life, such as starting new jobs, engaging in our education process, engaging in a vocation, matrimony, religious life, priesthood, or searching for that vocation, whatever it might be. As we engage in this, we start to find out more and more about our Lord. This is a very important thing. It's not usually in abstract reasoning that we come to understand Jesus. Some people might, you know, maybe more philosophical types, but most of us learn about Christ by engaging our faith with him as we go through life's adventures. It's kind of a mistake to think, well, I'm not going to enter any Christian kind of adventures unless I figure out who Jesus is. And I, I, I'm going to hold off on all that until I know all about Christ and got him figured out. And I don't think that's the way it is. It's sort of like trying to figure out your spouse by just sitting there and talking to him. It's going to be when you get married and you deal with finances, kids, buying a house, buying vehicles, getting jobs, losing jobs, getting opportunities, losing them, all these, all these adventures is where you get to know your spouse. All the more true in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We get to know him as we engage him in the adventures of life. And we can find out more and more about his true identity, his true humanity, and his true divinity. And we can see that something much more than a simple human being is revealed in his actions. Jesus knows people's hearts. It's hard enough for people to know their own minds and hearts. Think about psychologists who charge you, uh, there used to be $100 an hour, it's probably about $150, uh, and, you know, inflated bucks might be even more. And they, they would charge those this money to have you sit and tell them your life story. And they try to help you figure out your life. And sometimes it takes years. Some of these people would be in therapy for three years. You know, go, listen, because it's hard to know yourself. But God knows us in the depths. We don't, he doesn't need a psychologist to help figure us out. He knows our innermost thoughts better than we do and better than a psychologist does. It's very, very important. 
A psychologist can be helpful to us. I'm not against that by any means. But psychology has its limits. Christ doesn't. We also see the power that he has to cure the sick and even raise the dead. We see his power to forgive sins. All of this comes by being with him and engaging him in the adventures of life. And this is something that we see very much. We also pay attention to the gospel. And we see that at times he needs to take a nap. He was tired. That's why he fell asleep. So deeply asleep, he didn't even wake up for the storm. Sometimes he's so hung hungry, he has to send the apostles to go get some food while he just sits there and waits. He has to ask for water. He thirsts. He grieves and mourns. We see this with uh, uh, you know, Lazarus and also with the widow of Nain's son. He feels um, great, great mourning. And then um, we, we should also learn with him that like the apostles, we can marvel at him that this is something where we see this amazement at what Christ has done in our lives. A lot of times when we're in the midst of the adventures and crises of life, it seems that God is asleep. He's not answering. And yet, as we engage with him and go through the crises and difficulties, we can look back and say, I can't imagine. I can't imagine how much Christ did for me. God, uh, again, I always remember my mother saying to us on her last Christmas, I don't know how we fed you guys, but we always did. We always had enough. We could give you a place to live and some clothes and food. It just had to be God. At the time, she was feeling lots of anxiety. But it, looking back, she could see, oh, this was God working to make it possible. And this is a common experience that we have. And this is something that comes only as we stay faithful to Jesus. I celebrated a funeral the other day, a military funeral at the National Cemetery here in uh, Alabama. And a man who had stayed away from church since he got back from Vietnam, back in the 60s. And he was upset with God. As we talked and we had a good conversation. And when I mentioned that, it's probably not that you're an atheist, you just are mad at God. And he thought, oh, that makes sense. And I said at his funeral, the rest of us need to learn from that. You don't withdraw from God but if you're having difficulties with them, you engage in the conversation. You don't stay away from church. You come to church and get into the argument with them. In fact, the very name Israel means the one who struggles with God. That's their name and identity. This is what we have to do. And even like the apostles who had little faith, when they woke Jesus up, they still had enough faith to say, Lord, save us. Even if we have just a bit of faith, we start with that and let it grow. So consider your own faith at this point. Do you have a little faith? Is your faith maybe greatly enhanced? Maybe it's grown a lot? Maybe you feel like you have no faith at all. Imagine being with Jesus on that boat in the storm. Storms of life and in that storm in particular. And speak to him about your willingness to follow him in these adventures. Think about how life with its difficulties and, you know, we're looking at a lot of economic difficulties coming up and other difficulties. We need to call on Jesus in the midst of these storms and ask him, 
do you no know, what are the challenges to your faith is it challenge to almost extinction what are the difficulties you experience and listen to jesus what would he say to you about how much faith you have and how would he call you to deeper faith and conclude that again with the prayer soul of christ sanctify me body of christ save me blood of christ inebriate me passion of christ strengthen me we need that strengthening so that jesus would be our lord all right now i'm going to start off first of all with a question we have some michael calling in from florida michael what can we do for you today Hello, Father. How are you? Fine. It's good. I, I'm loving your teaching today because I had read a book by Brant Petrie that uh, revealed uh, that uh, in the Synoptic Gospels we don't have we don't are not taught that the divinity of Christ is shown so much or revealed so much as mm -hmm. it is in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. But yet this story reveals his divinity in a great way, and you have taught us today and showed us in Old Testament how to grab onto this and grow in our faith, mm -hmm. and I thank you very much for that. Yeah. And I wondered if you had any comments on, on how to respond to the people that are having a heresy today teaching that the Gospels were not written at the time they were written. They were written much later. You know, here's... This, this, uh, thank you for that uh, question. You know, I look at the Gospels fairly carefully. And um, I, I know the argument. And here's, here's the basic argument. Some of these folks say that our Lord did not, uh, the, or excuse me, the Gospels were written after 70 A.D., sometimes as late as 75 or 85 A.D. And this is uh, something that you say, okay, with your reasoning. Well, the reasoning is this. Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. Therefore, it could only be something that was written down after the destruction of Jerusalem. That's, their, that, that's the basis of most of their argument. And I don't follow that. And here's why. First of all, let me start off with something we can show easily. Let's take, take the Gospel of St. Luke, which is written along with Acts of the Apostles. There are two parts. The gospel first, then Acts. And in St. Luke's Gospel, we see that it includes about two-thirds of the verses in St. Mark's Gospel. Now, what do we conclude from that? That clearly, the Gospel of Mark was written before Luke. That would make sense. If two-thirds of Mark are found in Luke, then Mark was written first. Makes sense. And St. Luke says at the beginning of the gospel that he used various sources. He mentions that. But then, as you go through to the Acts of the Apostles, it ends with St. Paul under house arrest in Rome in the year 62 A.D. And it just stops after he has a debate with some of the Jewish people in Rome. It just stops. Now, if St. Luke were writing after the destruction of Jerusalem, which Christ predicts in his gospel, in the gospel of Luke, he predicts the destruction of Jerusalem. If he were writing about, uh, no, after the destruction of Jerusalem, he would have included it to show that what Christ said would happen did happen. But he stops eight years before the destruction. He stops uh, four years before the Jewish revolt started. Why did he stop? 
my conclusion, and not only mine, is because he didn't know what happened after 62 AD. He finished it in 62. Inconclusively, he, he spent the longest chapter of Acts of the Apostles on the martyrdom of Stephen the deacon. But he doesn't, and, but his main character wasn't Stephen, it was Peter and Paul. If he wrote after 70 AD, he would have mentioned the martyrdoms of his two heroes. And he doesn't. My conclusion is that he doesn't because he finished writing in 62, three years before they were martyred. That's why he didn't know about it. So I would put Luke Acts as being written by 62. That's when it stops. That's when he finished it. That also means, therefore, that Mark is written before that, probably in the 50s. And there are others um, who also believe that St. Matthew was written in the 50s based on evidence such as the penmanship style of the earliest fragment we have. The earliest fragment of St. Um, Matthew's gospel is from the early 60s. And the penmanship style there was that of the early 60s. Uh, so it was probably also written fairly early. So that's how I reason to it. And I disagree with them using a principle that if it predicts something, it had to be written after that thing happened. You really can predict things to happen. And they happen afterwards. People still do that. And things happen. So I would, that's why I don't, just based on looking at data, as best I can understand it, I don't think that the Gospels were written late. They're written in the 50s and 60s. That's my conclusion. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute, so please stay with us. Before we get back to questions, just want to have you join me for EWTN Live tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We will have as our guest Father Robert Nixon, OSB, a Benedictine father, and we will discuss his efforts to resurrect the writings of various, saint, various saints of the church and other holy people by bringing their books and manuscripts that have been out of print and some have never been published in English, trying to bring them back to life and make them available to modern readers. If that isn't a good mission for a Benedictine, I don't know what is, because the Benedictines have been absolutely essential in saving literature. They saved all the ancient literature in the West. God bless them, and so he's right back at it. So that's good. Also want to let you know that for those of you who live in the Nashville, Tennessee area, I will be joining the newly appointed pastor of a Maronite mission in Nashville for, to celebrate Corbono, the uh, Eastern liturgy. And that will be at the Catholic Church of Korean Martyrs. That's at 2319 Lebanon Pike in Nashville. That'll be 2 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. So look forward to seeing some of you in my old stomping grounds, but be celebrating the Eastern liturgy for our eparchy. All right, let's get another caller in. Maria in Florida, what can we do for you? Hello, Father Mitch. Uh, great blessing to speak with you. 
Um, my question is this. Um, after 50 years, I have returned to the faith, thank God, and my husband has converted. In the interim, uh, we became, before that, we became, um, we participate with the Masons um, fraternity and sorority. Mm -hmm. um, I have many friends who are Catholic, who are Masonic, um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and also the majority of them, if not all of them, are Christians. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way that I see it after being 23 years in these um, groups, they are not really religious at all. Mm -hmm. They're more, um, you know, they do gooders, mm -hmm. and uh, we get together and have a good time as well as having our regular business meetings. Mm -hmm. um, that said, because I have been away from the church for 50 years, I had the blessing of now really looking into the faith real deeply sure. to learn it correctly. Yes. Um, I am confused. I see many things in the in Google <laughs> Catholic sites about, yes, the Catholic Church allows it. No, the Catholic Church does not allow it. Um, and I have asked priests, some all of them have said that it was okay. I, I just want to hear it. You know, I'm trying to explain myself as best as I can in this matter. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So I want to sure. hear what you have to say. Thank you sure, so much. Sure, Maria. Thank you for that question. That's an important one. Um, there were uh, some opinions expressed, especially in the 80s that it was uh, uh, okay to, for a Catholic to be a Mason. Uh, eventually, that question was addressed to the um, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, and Cardinal, then Cardinal Ratzinger, later on Pope Benedict XVI, made it very clear that no, it's not compatible. Now, and let me say this too. This is not something that uh, means you can't be friends with these folks or anything. But the Masonic Lodge in includes a couple of elements that have been rejected from the beginning of the Lodge. This, the, the Masonic Lodge started around 1715 in, in England. And within less than 20 years, um, the, the, the Pope looking at it and you know, said, no, this is not acceptable because of the vows of secrecy. And in traditional Masonic Lodge, I don't know if they still do this, but in the traditional Masonic Lodge, when you take the oath never to tell the secrets of the Lodge, you do so uh, uh, they used to, I don't know if they still do, but they did do so by making this kind of sign and then making this kind of sign across their, their uh, lower stomach. And the idea is that if you reveal these secrets, you'll be cut from ear to ear and become disemboweled. That's what that was, what that was about. Now, I don't think, I don't know if they still take that kind of oath. Um, uh, I'm not privy to all of it, but it was in the Masonic books at least up until the 90s. Uh, so I don't know if that's still there. Um, I know that they've been having trouble getting new members. So this is uh, something that if you want to find out more about the difficulties for Catholics being in the Masonic Lodge, go to EWTN.com. And at our website, go to the document library. And in the document library, under the encyclicals, type in mas uh, 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 the Masons. Type in Masons. Or just type in, in general, in the library. You'll see a series of articles, but also a number of encyclicals rejecting membership in the Lodge. So that's been pretty official Catholic teaching. And Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, made it clear that that's still the case, okay? Sir, where are you from? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Good to have you here with us. What can we do for you today? Well, this is in regards to the permanent diaconate. Yes. When a man is uh, 
ordained a deacon, a permanent deacon. He mm -hmm. takes a vow of obedience, mm -hmm. makes a vow of obedience to his bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, can you expound, as only you can, yeah. upon that, uh, what that really means and what that maybe doesn't mean? Yes, it, the, the main thing that it means is you will have certain assignments as a deacon to various parishes. Now, normally the bishops discuss that with the deacons in terms of what they can and can't do in terms of where they live and their work and all that. But it's, it's his prerogative to assign you to a parish, also to give you various ministries. So for instance, uh, in some dioceses, the deacons are in charge of prison ministry, some of them in charge of hospital ministry, and uh, sometimes the tribunal. So he can give you that assignment. However, I want you to be very clear, that does not mean you don't listen to your wife. <laughs> you still have your wife to listen to, and the bishop can't get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then we have another, uh, uh, we have an email here. It says, Father Mitch, my adult son and I have interesting discussions about differing translations of passages from the Catholic Bible. We have the uh, New American Bible, NAB, NABRE, the Re New American Bible Revised Edition, Jerusalem Bible, Revised Standard, Revised Standard Version, Ca Second Catholic Edition, St. Joseph uh, New American Bible and the Didache Bible all on hand. And we also hear that there's so many different, or why are there so many different translations of the Catholic Bible? And why is there yet another translation Bible in progress? Holly. Uh, Holly, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the style of translation tries to deal with two things. Well, actually three things. One is getting the balance between literary style and literal translation. So Jerusalem Bible is in wonderful English style, but it's not quite so good on the literal side. While the Revised Standard Version is strong on the literal, not quite as literary. It's a good balance, I think. And New American Bible is trying to update to American diction, while there are other translations for the English, that, that is in Britain, Great Britain. And also some translations are for different reading levels. So those are some of the issues that you try to get at. Um, style and literal, literary, and uh, reading levels. So that's why they have all those differences. Um, I think, Holly, it's time for you to learn Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> all right. The Lord bless you all and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you this show and all the other shows because the network is brought to you by you, keeping us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay our bills too. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.